for those of you who may not know me or know me too well, my name is Scott. Um, for those of you who do know me, you're like, oh, he's wearing a shirt with buttons. Um, I thought of that this morning when brushing my teeth. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, so about... Okay, so earlier this term, Andy came up to me and was like, hey, Scott, do you think you might want to, like, share a message or two of this term in our series? And I was like, sure, yeah, that's cool. I had no idea what it was going to be on at all. Um, and if I, like, I thought about it, like, after he said that, I was like, what is there that I can even talk about? <laughs> um, so I can't really say too much about marriage. Definitely can't say a lot about dating. And um, two weeks ago, Andy came up to me. He's like, hey, you want to do the message in two weeks on, uh, on dating? I was like, oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I thought about it afterwards, and I realized, you know what? I'm totally qualified. I've got a 100% success rate. Um, <laughs> no experience at the same time, but I mean, <laughs> that's OK. Because the Holy Spirit's in me, um, and that should be enough to speak today. <laughs> um, and I want to sort of explain quickly before I really begin where I'm at on this whole thing. Um, as a young single guy who doesn't intend on staying single forever, I have a bit of interest in this topic. Just, <laughs> just saying. Um, <laughs> And actually, over the past few months, I've been reading a lot about it, thinking a lot about it, um, praying a lot about it. And so, I guess in a way, um, God had me prepping for this without even knowing it. So, I, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and like right now, I'd say I have certainly a much better understanding of like dating and relationships and stuff like that than I used to even a few months ago. I don't have all the answers, though. <laughs> I, there's still a lot of things that I'm trying to work out and figure out, but um, yeah, today will be fun. Um, so we're going to look at the book of Ruth today. Um, and when Andy suggested that I do this topic, he's like, okay, maybe you can do like a, you know, you can go through the Bible and find different examples and see what, see what there is. And I had no idea what I was going to talk about. Um, I thought about covering Samson and maybe like David or something like that, but um, there really wasn't a lot. And then I found the book of Ruth, and I, I fell in love with the story. It was just, like I, I had read it before, but I mean, I never like read it. And I really, really enjoyed it, and I, um, I realized as I sort of got into it, that was what I was going to talk about today. Um, we're going to focus on chapters two and three, the middle two in the book. It's pretty short. Um, so I'm going to give like a quick, very quick summary of the way the story starts, and then we'll go from there. Um, the story takes place during the time of the judges. If you want to learn more about that, you go one book back. Um, you can even read like the last three chapters of it, and you've got uh, gang rape, civil war, genocide, kidnapping, um, yeah, it's, it's, not a fun, it's not a fun point in history for the people of God. They've really got a lot of stuff going wrong. Um, and the story starts talking about a famine going on in Bethlehem. Um, you've probably all heard of the name Bethlehem. Ironically enough, the name means house of bread, and there's a famine. Um, and this guy named Elimelech takes his wife, Naomi, and their two sons um, to the country of Moab, neighboring Israel because they want food. Um, but Moab is a really, really awful place. There's a lot of sin. There's worship of a false god. And it really isn't the place for um, God's people to be. His sons end up marrying two Moabite women. Um, and then Elimelech and his two sons, they actually all die during the 10 years that they're there, which leaves Naomi with her two daughters-in-law on their own in a different country, and um, like they've got nothing. So Naomi goes back to Bethlehem. She hears that there's food again. 
Um, she decides to go back home, um, and one of her daughter, daughters-in-law goes with her, and her name is Ruth. Um, on the way there, Ruth declares that she's going to worship God. She's going to be a part of his people. Um, she's going to leave her home, leave everything that she knows in order to live for God um, and be with Naomi. Um, it's really, really powerful conversion. Um, if you get time later, just read that on your own. It's really, really, it's really cool. Um, and chapter one ends telling us that they get back into Bethlehem right at the start of the harvest season. So I'm going to read chapter two, just the first half of it. Um, get a feel for the story. It's, it's really fun, and there's, there's a lot in here. Okay. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go into the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Limelech. And just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she's the Moabites who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. So here we get, we get introduced to Boaz, and the way that it describes him is, it's called a man of standing. And so especially guys, I want you to watch Boaz in this story. I want you to pay attention to him um, because this is a really, really good guy. Um, he's, he's worth following, um, his, is following his example. Whether you're single or married, um, either way, like everyone, I think we can all, like especially the guys, we can really learn a lot from him. Um, and we'll see a lot in this story of what the sort of things that he does. Um, and for the women, I would say watch Ruth. Um, watch her, see what she does, how she is like, what her character is like. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, so Ruth, okay, Naomi and Ruth, they're poor. They have no food. They have no jobs, no income or anything. They've got no men in the house to help them. So Ruth's like, okay, can I go and glean in the fields behind the harvesters? Can I go and just pick up scraps of food, um, I, like in the fields? And this is sort of the equivalent of welfare in ancient Israel. Like in the law, it says that harvesters have to leave a little bit, like just a little bit for the poor, the orphans, the widows to pick up so that they won't starve. Um, 
It's a lot of hard work, and it's really dangerous for her to be out on her own like this. Um, she goes out, and the way, the way it describes it is really funny. In verse 3, it says, As it turned out, it just so happens, by chance, you know, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz. As Christians, we don't believe in luck. We don't believe in chance or fate or accidents. Um, when, when the Bible says, as it turned out, that's supposed to make us think, wait, wait a minute. What do you mean, as it turned out? Um, and we can see that God is working here. He's not working through, like, miracles and crazy, like, stuff from the book of Exodus or something, but he's working through his providence. He's arranging situations to um, work things out for his purposes. Uh, and we can see right away that God wants to bring Ruth and Boaz together, because as we learned last week from Andy's sermon, ultimately it's God who will arrange our marriages. It takes a lot of the pressure off when we know that God's helping us. We don't have to worry. We don't have to, like, freak out that everything's going to go wrong because if we trust him and we let him do his thing, it'll work out. Because God is sovereign. He's very good, and he does work to bring people together. I've got too many pages. Um, and when we see Boaz, in verse 4, it's like, Verse 3 and 4, he tells us how he owns a field, and so this guy is a wealthy businessman. He's successful. He loves God. He greets his workers with a blessing. That would be a great boss. Um, and as it turns out, he happens to be single. He's probably an older guy in his 40s, and you're thinking, why, why is this guy single? What's, what's going on? Why hasn't he gotten married yet? We don't know, but he's, but he's single. Um, and right away he gets to the field and he sees Ruth and he's like, who's that? T calls over his lead foreman and is like, okay, I've never seen this girl before. What's she doing here? Who is, who is this? Uh, he notices her right away. Uh, and you've got to think, like Ruth right now, she's dirty. She's sweaty. She's wearing rags. She's in this field hunched over. She's poor. She's like... Her hair is a mess. Um, she's a foreigner. She's a Moabite. And he notices her. He sees her. Um, and he's not like, Ugh, who's that? He's like, oh, who's that? Boaz isn't looking at outward appearances, but she, he's looking at her heart. Um, like he hasn't even talked to her yet. And he's like, whoa, she's cool. And in this, he's mimicking the character of God. He's not regarding her from a worldly point of view, as 2 Corinthians 16 says. He's looking at her through God's eyes. And for us, when we look at people through Christ, we can find gold in them that isn't readily apparent at first glance. Um, you know, on the outside, people might have a really messed up past. They come with a lot of baggage. Um, but we shouldn't get distracted by people's past because it's gone. People are new in Christ if they've been saved, and they're pure. We don't have to worry about whatever happened because we're pure. Ladies, you are all worth pursuing. And men, you are all sons of God, and that is your security, and you have no need to feel insecure. And honestly, when you look at them through Christ and you actually see them the way God sees them, you'll probably find them a lot more attractive. <laughs> so in verse 8, Boaz goes right up to her and talks to her, and that's surprising because she's her and he's him, um, and they don't really seem like they fit together. But he goes right up to her and addresses her as his daughter. He's like, my daughter. He's got a lot of respect for this girl and a lot of compassion. He sees her and he's concerned about her. He wants, 
he wants the best for her right away. So he makes sure that she's going to stay in that field where he can help her. He's said to his guys, you touch her, they will not find your body. Um, it's a big field. He gives her friends. He's like, hey, hang out with the other servant girls. You don't have to be here by yourself. Here's a community for you. And he's like, when you're thirsty, grab water. You don't have to get it from the men like you're supposed to. They're going to get it for you. He gives her a job for the entire harvest season, just for, like, for a few weeks so that she has that security. And she's like, why? Why are you, why are you doing this for me? Why, why on earth are you saying this to me? What have I done to deserve this? Like, she's like, I'm a foreigner. She is a Moabite. Moabites were a really rough group. They were enemies of Israel. There was wars. There was a lot of hatred between the two groups. Um, and so normally a Moabite woman in Israel would be an outcast at best. But Boaz is showing grace. She doesn't deserve his attention. She doesn't deserve his compassion. He's going above and beyond what the law would ever say about feeding the poor. And he tells her, like, I know what you've done for your mother-in-law and how you left everything to serve God, and I'm really impressed. I'm, I'm astounded by your character. And he prays for her. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the, God, by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. And he doesn't know it yet when he's praying this. He, like, he's just praying honestly. He wants the very best for her. He's not flattering her. He's not trying to impress her. This is just who he is. Um, and he's completely unaware that he's going to be one, he's going to be the one to answer his own prayer. He doesn't, he has no idea. Like we'll see, like we'll see later in the story, he had no idea that they were actually going to get married. Um, a little oblivious, but I mean, like, he, he just wants to bless her. In, and in this first conversation, there's just so much. You know, she, she replies to him, you've, you've given me comfort, you've spoken kindly to me when I didn't deserve it. Like, she's so humble. <laughs> He's like, look at what you did. And she's just like, what did they do? <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful conversation. Like right away, they're just open. They're honest with each other. They're frank. They're straightforward. They're not hiding anything. They're not putting a mask on. They're not trying to put on their best face. She's probably still sweating. Um, and... They talk to each other, and they just really encourage one another, and they, um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really amazing, actually, that something like this would even happen. Um, so we're going to move to the next section where things get interesting. Um, the, I'll read the rest of chapter two where Ruth and Boaz kind of go on a date. Um, the Bible says a little bit, a little, little about dating. And this is mostly it. Because, um, like, they hadn't really invented dating back then. They were just sort of like, hey, we're single, let's get married, and then they got married. They, they skipped. They, they, they were really good at skipping the, the middle parts. Um, but I'll read here. At mealtime, so that same day, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Hey, even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up, and don't rebuke her. 
So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ipa. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, this man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite has said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they're finished harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Do you guys like that? Is that fun? I think it's fun. I, th I think it's really cool. Um, verse 14, Boaz invites her on a date, sort of. He calls her out. She's like, she's sitting there working. She's like, I'll eat, I'll eat after I get home, maybe. I'll munch on some barley. <laughs> and Boaz is like, okay, this girl's just gotten back to Bethlehem, and they're poor, and uh, she probably hasn't eaten. So, hey, come over here. <laughs> you need food. I'm going to feed you calls her out, gets her to come over and share a meal with him. He makes sure that she has enough food and more to spare so that she has some to take back home to her mother-in-law because he's like, I'm going to make sure that I give something to the mother-in-law too because he's smart. <laughs> <laughs> really smart. Um, and he's putting the bill He's the one providing. He's, he's not saying, okay, you work for like an extra three hours today and then that'll, that'll cover your meal. He's like, no, I, I need you. Like, stop, stop working. Get over here. Eat something. Uh, he's footing the bill because he's the kind of guy who has the ability to afford that. Then take note. And, okay, we, we can look at this and say, oh, it's like a date because they're together and it's just them and it's not just them. Um, it's sort of like a half date, half hangout session. Um, have you had hangout sessions before? <laughs> Probably. Because um, there's other guys here. There's other harvesters here. He's like, hey, come over here. She sits down. There's a bunch of other sweaty guys and probably some of the other servant girls and stuff. So they're not like, they're not by themselves, but... Still, he invited her over, he got her food, and they're spending quality time together. And they're building a relationship like that. And I think that, that is what really counts. Like, I think last, last week um, in lunch, there was a conversation, and it was like, okay, what happened to dating? Like, what, what happened to it? Um, like, did it just disappear, and what do we do now? Or, and I think what some of us were talking about was, well, dating still happens. Not in our church quite so much. Um, for now. Um, but there's sort of a second alternative when you want to get to know somebody. Um, I think, like, simply being a friend with someone and simply spending time with them in either a group setting or occasionally one-on-one -on -one, you can get to know them better. Um, and I think spending time with one another and building relationships, even just friendships, um, is something that's really good to do. And I think, like, even, I think Boaz here, he's not, 
I think he's unknowingly pursuing her. I think he's not quite aware what he's doing. Um, because he, like, he just wants to bless her. He's not, he's not thinking about, okay, I'm going to do this, and then she'll like me, and then you know, we'll get married. He's like, I'm, I'm going to do this because I want to bless her. I, re- I really love this girl. I want to bless her. Um, he's not really worried about how it's going to turn out. He doesn't care. He wants to make sure that she's taken care of. Like, that's more important to him. And then, like, she gets up to leave. She gets up to go back to work because she's really hardworking. She's not lazy. She's not like, well, I've eaten. Time for a nap because I'm full and naps are great. She's like, okay, thanks for the food. I'm going to go back. Thanks. She runs off. And, like, the other guys are, like, getting up. They're like, okay, time to go back. And Boaz is like, guys, wait. Come here. Come here. Okay, you see her out there? Yeah, yeah. Give her special treatment. Make it easy for her. Make sure that she gets so much that her and her mother-in-law are not going to be starving anymore at all. Make sure that as long as she's working hard, she's going to get so much out of this. She's going to be so blessed. And she's not even going to know because she doesn't know how much food she's going to get from one day. She's like, I'm just going to pick up what I get and hope it's enough. And she has no idea that Boaz is doing this for her. He's sort of keeping it in the background. He, he waits until she's left and gone back to the field. And then he's like, okay, guys, this is what we're going to do for her. He's showing her so much grace. Um, and it is really beautiful. It's like... I, I see this, and I'm like, whoa, dude, good call. Like, he, he really wants to love this girl. And I, like, as I said, he's sort of pursuing her unknowingly. He doesn't, he doesn't seriously think that there's a chance that they would end up getting married. We'll see that later. Um, but he wants to bless her, and he's going to make things not like, he's not just going to give her a handout. He's not just going to say, here, take some food back home and have fun for the rest of the day. He, he wants to make sure that she's still doing something, that she's still working, because it's right that someone would work for their food. Um, he's not giving her a handout, but he's, he's really, really um, giving her a lot. And I think... I think there's a bit of pursuit in here. He doesn't quite know it, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, he kind of has a thing for her, I think. Um, so Ruth, she, she works until the evening. It's late. She's tired. She's exhausted. She's like, okay, okay, I got my grain. I'm going to thresh it out so we can bake bread and eat it. I'm going to go home. And she's got this big sack. Um, the footnote here says it's probably about like 22 liters in one day. Like, that's crazy. She goes back home. She's like, hey, I got, I got the food. Naomi's like, where did you go? <laughs> Whose field did you go to? This is amazing. And she's like, oh, I went to this field. Like, his, his name is Boaz. He gave me some food. Oh, and he had some extra food for you. <laughs> That was like, bless him. Bless that guy. He took notice of you. He showed you favor. Bless him. Naomi was out just completely, she was just stunned by what Boaz had done. I don't, I, I don't think Ruth quite understood until she got home just how outrageous that that grace, that love was. But they're talking, they're having a conversation, and it's like, yeah, this, his name was Boaz, and Naomi's like, this guy's one of our close relatives. He's a kinsman redeemer. And what that means is, um, in ancient Israel, if the husband of a wife died, 
and sort of left the family without kids, um, a close relative could come in and buy the land back from the husband in order to perpetuate their family and he would have kids and stuff and so that original dad who was there, um, he wouldn't completely disappear. He'd still have something after him even though he had died. Um, and Boaz, he's related enough to Elimelech that he has the ability to do that if he wants to. He's not obligated. He has, he has no obligation under the law to do anything. Um, like everything that he's done just on this first day, on the first day that he and Ruth have met, everything that he's done is completely grace. There's no like, he's not doing it because it says somewhere in Deuteronomy that you have to give like a whole bunch of food to foreigners who find themselves in your field. Um, Like he's just doing this out of the kindness of his heart because his character is like Christ. And it's, it's just spectacular. And Ruth is saying to her, okay, he said to me, not only can I, did I do that today, but I can come back until the harvest is done. And they're going to be there for like six or seven weeks. And the amount of food that she's gotten in one day, if she works like this for the next few weeks, that's a year's pay. Boaz is making sure that even after Ruth goes, after she leaves, and she can't find another source of income, other work, her and her mother-in-law are taken care of. Because he's thinking about them and he wants them to be blessed. He's making sure that they'll be okay. Because he knows that no one else is really going to do anything for them. He makes sure that well, she's protected. He's already told his guys, don't touch her. Don't, don't do anything to this girl. Yeah, she's vulnerable, she's poor, she's on her own. But don't touch her. You know, he's setting boundaries for the other guys. He's mentoring the other guys. He's like, guys, come here. Let me, let me show you how to do this, how to treat a woman properly. And, you know, the more, the more I've read this story and looked at Boaz and his character, the more impressed I've been because, well, he's the kind of guy that I look at and it's like, I want to be like that. I want to be like that. I want to put others' needs above my own. I want to be able to bless people financially if I have the ability to. I want to show grace to people and not just do what I have to do. I want to be able to show love to people just because it's the way that God is and I want to be like God. So Ruth, she stays in that field. She goes back every day. She works, except she works six days. They take the Sabbath off. They get their day off because God was like, thou shalt have a day off and have fun. And enjoy me. I, I really like that. Um, but verse 23 is interesting, and there's a lot here, because it says, she stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. So that's about six or seven weeks. And nothing happens. You know, we're looking at this, like, oh, first day, they're like, talking, they're eating together, this is great, we know where this is going, and then the next few weeks, nothing happens. Boaz doesn't say anything to her that's here. We don't see any conversation, we don't see any second date, we don't see anything. He doesn't call her, he doesn't text, like, he's, he drops the ball. Um, and that's for a season. For this harvest season, you know, he blesses her, he makes sure that she's okay, and then he keeps his distance. He doesn't do anything else for her. 
Like, he's, he's still good to her, but, I mean, he's not, he's not actively trying to pursue her for marriage. He's quiet. He's, you know, comes to the field, checks up on things, and, you know, heads into town to do business. And she's working there. She's doing her thing, getting food. Um, and so I think for her, this could be a really tough season because after that one first day, when it's like, whoa, this is amazing, she comes back, and then nothing happens. He doesn't say anything to her. And she's like, what, what happened? What if, like, could, could, could that have changed? Could anything have come out of that? She doesn't know. She has no idea where the relationship is at. Things are unclear. She doesn't know what's going on. But I think what God is letting her experience here is a tough season where she doesn't know what's going on in order that she would continue to rely on God's timing and not her own. She knows that God is good. She left Moab to serve him, to be with him. She trusted him. She knows that he's good. And she's trusting him in this season. Even if it's hard, even if it seems like things are going nowhere and there's nothing going on and you know any hopes she might have had earlier they seem to have sort of evaporated that doesn't matter because God is still there and God is still blessing her every day and she knows that and she trusts God and for us this idea of seasons um, it really plays into our lives as well like I've been really um, I've been really blessed to have even heard of this concept, the idea that as we go through our life, there, we have different phases of life, different seasons where God is interacting with us in a very unique way. He brings along certain challenges designed to grow us into the men and women that he wants us to be. Like I think it's in Ecclesiastes 3, it says like there's a season and a time for everything under heaven. God brings us through different seasons, and one of those seasons is the season of singleness. You can tell you're in it because you're single. <laughs> you're not in a relationship with anyone, and you're not married. And during that time, um, well, like Andy gave the talk on singleness a few weeks ago, and during that time, we learn to really trust God. We may think, okay, I do want to be married someday. Right now, it's not happening. That's cool, because God is with me. He's growing me. He's getting me ready. He's preparing me. He's doing things, and I'm going to trust him regardless of what's going on. Because very often, not always, but very often, this season is temporary. It doesn't last forever. Most of us in this room are either not single or we are single, but we won't be forever. There may be some who God gives the ability to remain single, and that can be a blessing in itself, but that's not the norm. And so this season that Ruth is in right now and that many of us, I think, we can find ourselves in, it is very temporary. And it's important to make use of it, but also to watch, to watch the seasons. if. You know, if you're sitting there, um, you've got a house or something like that because you're older and you've got a job and house, and it's like November or December, and you're like, weather's great, things are cool, no, no more rain. Actually, there would probably be a lot of rain. Um, things are great, life is good. And then suddenly, one day, you walk outside and you can't, get out of your house because you're living in Wasag Beach and got three feet of snow in front of your door. And you're like, what happened? The season changed. And if you're not watching, you might suddenly find yourself in a position where it's like, oh, what do I do? What do I do now? I didn't, I didn't prepare. I didn't, I didn't get ready. I didn't, I didn't know that this was coming. So it's important to discern when seasons are changing, to watch, to to wait, to work while you wait, like Ruth does. 
but to watch and to recognize when things are changing. That being said, it can be really hard to do on your own. Like, how do you know when you're in the right season to get into a relationship? How, how on earth do you figure that out? You know, it's not like you can go to, I don't know, Song of Solomon. There was like this list of like, they did this, they did this, they did this, and then they got into their relationship and made this beautiful book. Um, it doesn't. All we know about Solomon is that he had a lot of wives and it was a really bad idea. Um, he could have probably used his own wisdom. Actually, he wrote Ecclesiastes probably later in life and he was probably like, I wish, I wish I had known this. God, you gave me wisdom, but this would have been better. Um, it's, it's hard to discern it on our own. And I can't tell you exactly how to do that. I don't know how to do that. Um, I don't have all the answers, but wisdom is important. Prayer is essential. Like actually saying to God, God, where am I right now? What are you doing in my life? What do you want to see me do? Where are you taking me? What are you doing? Um, seeking God's will and direction needs to be at the center of anything that we're doing. Regardless of whether or not like, you're in a relationship or you're not in a relationship, you need to know what God is doing for everything. Um, because something like mutual attraction, I don't think is on its own enough to justify a relationship. There needs to be something more than that. Because if we want to get married, we're looking for a good spouse, not just a good time. We're not just looking to have fun, although it will be very fun but we're looking for something that's gonna last and that's gonna be really blessed. And so there's spiritual maturity that's important, having a solid relationship with God and trusting him to lead and guide you and actually really, really trying to discern his will and being willing to do what he wants you to do. Because sometimes that means, oh, you get to do something that you want to do too because your will happens to be aligned with what he wants and that's really fun. And then there's physical maturity. You need to be financially prepared. You need to be emotionally stable and ready for, you know, having two people squished into one is crazy. Um, I don't know how that's going to look like. But ultimately, you need to look for God's leading. And if he is the one who brings two people together, then it will happen at the right time. We can have faith in him. But we need to listen to him and see what he does. Okay. Chapter 3, one of the weirdest parts in the entire Old Testament. How, okay, how many of you guys have, like, read the book of Ruth sort of recently enough that you sort of know what goes on here? Awesome. Everyone else, this is so much fun. Um, okay, I'm going to read all of chapter 3. So one day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, that being Ruth, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been a kinsman of ours? Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go in and cover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. <laughs> I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. <laughs> so she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. And in the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. <laughs> I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. 
all my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. And although it is true that I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good. Let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back into town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did they go, my daughter? <laughs> That's the way I read it. Um, <laughs> That she told her everything Boaz, Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me this, these six measures of barley, saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed, because he's smart. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. So they're running out of time. Naomi knows that Ruth's job is only temporary. She sees Boaz, she's like, I'd be a great husband, Ruth. Come here. <laughs> and we see here Naomi really acting as a mentor figure for her, really giving Ruth guidance, counsel, telling her what she can do in order that she can move forwards and, you know, get married. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, but... Um, what we see here is that it's really wise to seek out counsel, especially when it comes to relationships. Like out of anything you do in your life, if you want to get advice on it, I think this is the biggest thing. Doing it on our own and then sort of informing other people later is unwise. We need to get godly input from people who can see into your situation and give you some guidance because the people who are above you, people who are um, like leaders in the church in authority over you, they've got a unique vantage point on the situation. They can see a bigger picture than you can. They can see maybe where you're at more clearly than you can. And you may think, I don't know if I'm ready for this, but this is what I'm thinking. They're like, okay, we were waiting for this. You know, you're ready, let's do this. Um, in the book of Proverbs, I read through it the other day, and there's so many times it says, seek counsel, seek counsel, get advice, talk to people, make sure that you're not doing things on your own. Proverbs 15.22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Get help from people who love you, they aren't against you. The people around you are for you. Don't, don't just talk to people who you know will give you the answer you want to hear because it's not really helpful. Um, talk to people who you know are willing to be honest with you and share the truth in love. Now, when it comes to Naomi's advice, it's a little strange, to say the least. Like, it's, it's really weird. Um, <laughs> it's funny, but... We, we look at this and we may think, what on earth is she doing? What, what is she telling Ruth to do? What is this? And if we hadn't had God involved in the story as much as he was already, we might doubt what, no, what Naomi suggests. But I think what she tells Ruth to do is inspired by the Holy Spirit through a lot of prayer. Like, it works. Um, I, I think if God were not in favor of what was going on, it would not have worked. So Naomi is seeking God's will, and Ruth herself responds positively because she really trusts God, she trusts the people he has put over her, and she knows that she's in God's hands. And this is a big risk, this is a really risky move. A lot of things could go wrong, and Ruth doesn't know how it's gonna turn out. And she, Ruth herself might be kind of frightened to do this. It takes a lot of courage. It's really bold. Um, but often the thing that we're most afraid of doing is exactly what we need to be doing. And Ruth sees that. And 
we, like Ruth, need to trust in God if he's the one moving us towards someone. So in verse 7 into 9, Ruth makes her move. And we can look at this and say, is she, is she pursuing Boaz? And I think it's no. I think, I think the answer here is no, because men, men do have the responsibility and privilege of pursuing women. Um, and there's something very important behind that that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and we know that girls shouldn't chase boys. It's not, it's not the best approach. Um, and it's really hard to find good men like that if you're simply chasing after people. Um, but while women shouldn't pursue men, because that's supposed to be the other way around, you can follow the example of Ruth and make yourself visibly available for pursuit. She's not pursuing him. She's not chasing after him. She's just sort of stepping in front of him and saying hi and letting him, letting him pursue her, but sort of giving him a bit of a push. Because that can be helpful. Because sometimes guys have no clue what's going on. And they may be worried about approaching a girl who they think may not be ready for a relationship. You know, they may not want to burden someone with that, and so they may do nothing. But I think it's okay for girls to sort of make known where they're at in order um, for there just to be clarity so that there's um, not a lot of confusion so that people aren't sitting there wondering what on earth is going on. Um, women, don't, you don't have to be helpless in a situation like this. And then, okay, when Ruth goes in and she's like, I'm your servant, spread the corner of your garment over me. The other translation is, put your wing over me. So she's like, answer the prayer that you prayed back there. When she's proposing that he propose, <laughs> Boaz is surprised, not because he didn't love her, but because he thought that she was too good for him. He expected that she would want to marry maybe one of the younger guys because Boaz is a bit older and perhaps not very handsome. He, like, I, like, I'm being serious. This guy's being really humble. He's like, what do you want with me? All I am is single and rich. <laughs> and God, I, I, love, I, love, I love Jesus. I'm rich. I'm single. What on earth do you want with me? Um, he's, he's really humble. And in a way, Ruth is looking past the surface. She's, she's doing what Boaz did earlier. She's seeing what's in him and ignoring the fact that he's probably in his late 30s or early 40s, and she's maybe late 20s. There's a big age gap, but Ruth is looking past that. And then when Boaz knows that Ruth desires marriage, he moves right away to make that happen. He discerns that it's God's will that, they're, that they have to do this, that they get to do this. Um, and he's like, this is a woman of noble character. This is a worthy woman. But there's a relative that's closer to Elimelech, and he has the right and responsibility and obligation to marry into that family and buy the land. And so Boaz says, you know what? If he wants to do it, good, let him do it. I'm not going to step in the way of that. But if he doesn't, I will do it. Because there's the issue of the community around them. Things have to be considered, and Boaz can't just marry Ruth right away. He can't just do what he wants. He needs to stick with the customs and guidelines of the culture that they're in. And that, in that context, that means that other guy gets first dibs. Actually, that's probably bad wording. Uh, that was not the Holy Spirit. Um, the other, guy, the other guy has the responsibility to do this. So he's going to go talk to him. He's going to work things out. But he can't do anything quite yet. Because there's more than two people being affected here. And Boaz is very aware of that. He wants to marry her. 
He really does. But he's going to make sure that he does it right, that he doesn't skip anything, that he doesn't undermine the community that they're in. Verses 15 and 17. It's like, okay, you, you go back home. Here's another gift for your mother-in-law. He's really smart. He's building a relationship with the family, um, and I think that that's something that's very important to do too. So Ruth, Ruth goes back home. She tells Naomi what happened. I don't know if any of them really slept that night. <sighs> They're probably like, how is this going to work out? Um, and Naomi now tells her to wait. And Ruth doesn't need to do anything anymore. Boaz is the one who's going to make sure things get worked out. It's his responsibility, and he's going to waste no time, because once he knows that it's God's will, he's moving. He's like, okay, this is, if this is the will of God, then I'm not going gonna, I'm gonna, not, not gonna to waste time here. And so I think for us, we need to seriously consider where we are where we're at in our lives. And I think if we feel God leading us to do anything, regardless, like pursue a relationship or do anything, we feel God is leading to do so, then we need to follow what God is leading us to do. It's a matter of obedience. And, man, I think if you have a sense that God is moving you to do something, to initiate a relationship with someone, if you've brought it to people over you who can help you, who can really discern God's will and direction and give you solid counsel, if you've taken into consideration what the effect on that community will be, if you're in a season where you're prepared physically and spiritually, you're very ready to move forwards and that's clear to you, then it might be the time to do something about that. You need to follow God's leading. You need to do what he is asking you to do and nothing else. And don't be afraid to have the initiative of Boaz and don't be afraid of being willing to take a risk like Ruth. And honestly, the time is not right, then don't worry about it. Don't, don't let it bug you. Don't you know, things will happen when they happen, and you can trust God in that, because God works all things out for our good. He's very trustworthy, and he loves us. But if he's pushing you to do something, then consider it. Okay. Chapter 4, Boaz goes into town. He settles the legal issues surrounding the marriage. He declares publicly that he's going to marry Ruth, buy back their land. They marry there's a baby. His name is Obed. I don't know what that name means. Uh, and this family, this family is the family of King David, we find out. And later, the family of Jesus. And so we see that this story has bigger significance than simply two people coming together. There's more to it than just them. There's a lot of people involved here. We're all here because they got married and because that family happened. We wouldn't be here otherwise. And what we see in this story above, above anything, above any ways to go about being in a relationship or starting something or doing whatever, that's, that's secondary to the main message of the story. This is a picture of Jesus. The entire Bible is completely about Jesus, and there's no exception. This is no exception, because Jesus himself was saying to his disciples, this is all about me. I'm going to do a study now that I'm risen from the dead. We're going to spend the whole day talking about the whole Old Testament, and I'm going to show you how it shows me. And so he would have covered the book of Ruth, and he would have said, I'm the main character in this story. My name isn't quite there, but I'm the one who's the center of this. Because we ourselves are like Ruth. We are dirty, we're poor, we're helpless, 
broken. We are in need of a redeemer. Jesus is our redeemer. He is our Boaz. He pursues us. He comes after us. He calls us. He calls us over. He says, come sit down with me. Have a meal. He says, I'm going to get everything out of the way so that we can be together. I will give myself for you. And this is why I think men are to pursue women. It's a picture of what Christ does for us. He's, he's the one who pursues the church, his bride. And so, you know, when a man pursues a woman, when they get married, even in their relationship, that in and of itself is a metaphor for what's really going on. It's not that the whole, the church is the bride of Christ and Jesus is the bridegroom. That's not a metaphor for marriage. It's the other way around. Marriage itself is designed to point us towards Jesus. It's designed to show us the gospel, to show us what he's done for us. He, like Boaz, shows grace that we don't deserve. He changes us from an enemy of God and God's people, and he brings us into a family. He dies for us. He does more than Boaz ever could do. He dies for us so that we can be with him forever because he really wants that for us. And when we see the story, we have to remember that this is us in here. We're Ruth. Jesus is Boaz, but he's a better Boaz. Boaz was imperfect. We all are imperfect. But Jesus is perfect. And his love for us is perfect. His grace that he shows to us is unending and never fails. It is the one thing that remains. And realizing this is more important than anything else that we get from the story. If we walk away with nothing else, we have to know that God loves us. And this story reveals that to us, and it shows us that love. It gives us a taste of what it's like when we see Boaz, we're like, this guy has outstanding character. This guy is amazing. He's fantastic. When we see Ruth, she's like, she doesn't even compare to him. And Boaz is like, I'm, I'm going to bless you. I don't, I don't care what the social customs are. I don't, that doesn't matter. That, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to show love to you that you didn't ask for. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to speak to my Father about you. I'm going to send my Spirit to you so that even when I'm not physically with you, the Spirit is with you so that you're never alone. And he's coming back. He's going to come back, and it's going to be amazing. There's going to be this great banquet. There's going to be him and we're going to get to see him face to face. You know, when, when he's doing the Last Supper with the disciples, he was following a lot of Jewish customs at that time that spoke about marriage. Him doing the Last Supper was him committing himself to the church, saying, you are my bride, I'm your bridegroom. And I'm leaving for a little while, but I'm going to come back. I'm I'm just preparing a place for you. You don't know when I'm coming back, but I'm coming back to be with you forever. And like Ruth, right now we simply wait. We can't, we can't do it on our own. We can't make that happen on our own. We need to wait and we need to trust God that he keeps his word, that he is good, he loves us. And we can trust him. I 
think that's it. There's not, there's not much more that I can say here, but take time on your own like when you go home through the week. Read through this story and really look for ways and ask God to show you the ways that it reveals him and his heart for you. Let this love story be a love story between you and God. And if you, if you know him already, you get to see this and you're like, this is going to be great. I'm so thankful for his grace. And if, if you don't quite know him, maybe, he's sitting there calling, come over here. Come sit down with me. I want to be with you. And he's, he's done everything. It's all taken care of. We don't need to do anything. We just need to accept what he's done for us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Jesus, thank you. You are so good to us, and we don't deserve it. We're, we're, we're not undeserving, we're ill-deserving. We've done so much to push you away, God, but you don't care about that. You say, I want you. You say, I love you. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to make you so blessed. I'm going to give you everything and more. And Jesus, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for, for all that you've done for us and how you've changed us, you've made us new, you've called us to you. And you, you saw past our brokenness and you said, there's something there that I want. There's something there that I really, really love. You saw something in us that we don't even see ourselves. And you love us. And we, all we can do is thank you and praise you. We thank you for the story of Ruth, God. Um, for how you were working through that and how we get to hear about it even today, thousands of years later. And it's still helpful to us. There's still things that we can learn from it. There's still things that we can glean from it. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. Thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you are doing. Thank you for blessing us, God. You're very good to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.